planning board. Okay, Mr. Marshall, um, my computer says 632. You do have a quorum. Um, Amherst Media is in the house. Your attendees are coming on in and I think you are good to go. All right, thanks, Pam. You're welcome. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of February 1st, 2023. My name is Doug Marshall, and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.33. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022, and extended again by the state legislature on July 16th of 2022, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is available on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so, for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript, or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and return to mute. Bruce Calden. Here. Tom Long. Present. Andrew McDougall. Present. I, Doug Marshall, am present. Janet McGowan. Here. Uh, we know that Johanna Newman will be late, so we'll try to note the time that she arrives. Karen Winter. Here. Thank you all. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your request and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. To the general public, the general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting when deemed appropriate by the chair. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, Please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. All right, so the first item on our agenda this evening is uh, uh, discussion of minutes and um, hopefully approval of the minutes. And the minutes that we had in the packet this for this evening are the minutes from our first meeting in January. Uh, I believe that was January 4th. So planning board members, do you, does anyone have any comments on those minutes? And if not, uh, I would be happy to entertain a motion to approve them as drafted. Janet, Bruce, Allison, you're, you're second. For Janet? Um, I was, I thought they were excellent and I was gonna move that we accept the minutes. Okay. Um, Bruce, you are muted. I will second that motion. 
All right, we have a motion on the floor and it's been seconded. Uh, before we go to a vote, I'll ask one more time, does anybody have any comments they wanna make? All right, Andrew. Mine's super minor and I'm fine if we don't wanna put it in, but there was a reference to the height of the arborvitaes in there. That's 15 feet and I think, I was trying to remember whether they said they would actually keep them trimmed at a lower height, but it's it's like 10 to 15 feet. So I think there is like a difference in terms of appearance as you're coming down that 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 road, if it's, you know, one story or one and a half stories. Um, so maybe we can just amend it to 10 to 15 feet. And if somebody remembers whether there was a comment about it being trimmed, you know, we can put that in, but it's not that big of a deal to me. Okay. Uh, Chris. I think they said they were going to choose a species that didn't grow taller than 15 feet. That was my memory. Yeah, that was mine as well. Okay, well, that's fair enough. Um, all right. So does that part of the minutes need to be edited? I mean, that species is like 10 to 15 feet. If you, if, you know, we can put that in there, but again, okay. I'm not going to fight for it. Chris, were you all right with that? Okay. All right, um, so uh, the folks who made the motion and seconded, uh, are you okay with that friendly amendment? Yes, yes, I, I remember exactly as uh, Andrew and I noted it when I was reading the minutes too, but I, I, I let it go. It was 10 <laughs> to 15 and uh, they it's reported as 15, but I didn't think it was critical, but I would prefer them lower. So 10 to 15 is good for me. Okay. And Janet, you're all right with that? Yes, I defer to other people's memories. Okay. All right, good. Then um, ready to vote. Uh, Bruce. I approve. And Tom. Approve. Andrew. Aye. Janet. Hi. Uh, I do not see Johanna yet, so she's absent. And Karen. Approve. And I'm an approve as well. So that's six in favor and one absence. Great. So now we can go on to the second item on the agenda. It's now 640 and we will have public comment. So are there any members of the public that would like to make a comment? And um, just a reminder, these are, it should not be a comment about the proposed zoning amendments that we're gonna be discussing this evening. Mr. Marshall, would you like, how many minutes? Um, why don't we do uh, three minutes? All right, I see Darcy Dumont uh, had her hand up first. So why don't we bring her over Hello, Darcy, if you could give us your name and your street address, and uh, you have three minutes. Hi, um, good evening. My name's Darcy Dumont. I live on Pondview Drive in Amherst. Um, and my comment is just a general comment. Um, Pondview Drive is one of the few low to moderately priced neighborhoods left in Amherst. And for the time being, it's, it's still a gem. It's one of the most diverse neighborhoods in town in terms of being interracial with families living here from a multitude of countries, getting to know each other as neighbors and sending their kids to Crocker Farm School. I've been here since 1995 and my two kids went to school at Crocker Farm and graduated from ARPS. My neighborhood is unique in that it was built in the late 60s and early 70s as so-called starter homes, but the, uh, in fact morphed into one where folks stayed until retirement uh, or longer <laughs> because they love the neighborhood. We have a group on my street which is fondly referred to as the Grand Dames of Pondview Drive who have lived here since the 70s and brought their kids up together. Some of them uh, living in the original are as original owners of their homes. Thus, it's with great horror that the neighborhood is being threatened by developers and profiteers seeking to buy up and rent single family homes to students. 
were um, being bombarded by mailings and phone calls from outfits who offered to pay us cash for our homes, not worry about even cleaning our homes out or whatever they think will convince us to sell. And this has now increased the number of homes in the neighborhood rented to students. I now have one next door and two others within view. This changes the nature of the neighborhood in that it simply subtracts from the number of families that participate in and care about the schools in the neighborhood. My experience is that rentals are maintained by landlords who can't see all the trash left next to the garbage cans and the mess left on the lawns after parties or when seven cars attempt to park off street overnight. The residents of those houses don't interact with their neighbors and don't contribute to the family neighborhood because they're usually there for no longer than one or two years at the most. And there's no enforcement that I can see of the four person per home rule. Our priority, uh, in my opinion, should be retaining our existing low to moderate price single family neighborhoods for Amherst families, including those who are looking to become first time homeowners and for our own town staff. If we don't, we'll lose our precious, highly diverse family neighborhoods that are so special and that so many love. Thank you. Thank you, Darcy. All right, and the second uh, hand I see is from Ira Brick. We can bring Ira over. Ira, please give us your name and your street address. Hi, I'm Ira Brick. 255 Strong Street. If you knew that the majority of our community doesn't want what would happen if you remove the need for permitting on duplexes, triplexes, and townhouses, would you still so boldly make such hugely consequential changes in our zoning? If you knew that the deregulation would open precarious floodgates, so many more neighborhoods becoming overwhelmed with student rental housing, so many more owner-occupied homes becoming student rentals, so many more UMass faculty and staff, families, retirees, professionals unable to attain housing in Amherst, would you still make that risky decision? If you knew that there was no end of demand for housing in Amherst and that our delicate and deteriorating roads and infrastructure, as well as our strained public safety staff, cannot afford the additional burden, would you be so confident of the road you're taking us all down? Please consider doing more of what Amherst is doing less and less. Listen to the concerns and perspectives of the community where you live and not pursue a path with so many unknowns and unintended consequences. In conclusion, do not relax the requirements to get permits, have hearings, and keep a butters informed. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ira. Are there any more members of the public that would like to speak at this time? Okay, I don't see any. I think uh, right around now is when I usually read the names of the people who attend uh, as, as attendees, public, come, uh, public attendees. So I see, in addition to Darcy and Ira, I see Elizabeth Veerling, Hilda Greenbaum, Jean Hardy, Jennifer Taub, Mandy Jo Haneke, Mario DePillis, Pam Rooney, and Patricia DeAngelis. All right, and uh, I think it was while Ira was reading that I saw that Johanna has now joined us. So that was right about 6.45. Um, looks like my... Freeze that. It's Max Headroom. <laughs> dog's having technical problems. Oh my goodness. You're you back. Go. Okay. Boy, that was pretty interesting, huh? Yeah. At least on my end, the video was uh, pretty wild. Okay. So uh, okay. thank you, Johanna, for joining us. All right, the time is 647 and we'll go to the third item on the agenda, which is the proposed zoning amendments, uh, mostly around article three, use regulations regarding duplexes, townhouses and converted dwellings. 
And we have Mandy Joe and Pat DeAngelis, uh, town councilors, here to present uh, to us this evening. Welcome, Mandy Joe and and Pat. There we go. All right. Thank you. Oh, let me. There we go. Um, and and Pat is joining us and will participate as she is able today. So I will be doing most of the presentation. Um, I'm going to share my screen um, so that you can see everything and bear with me. Okay, you should be able to see it now. Yes, indeed. Thank you for having us today for a further um, discussion and presentation on our proposed zoning revisions to duplex, triplex townhouse converted dwellings and subdividable dwellings, which isn't mentioned on this slide. Um, we hope we can answer some questions and have a nice discussion today. Um, as we mentioned last week, the defining principles and our goals in proposing these revisions include equity in housing, addressing the housing crisis, improving sustainability, and um, creating more logic in our use table for permitting requirements. Um, in equity and housing, we are aiming to eliminate exclusionary zoning policies in town, um, the exclusionary single family home zoning policy in towns. We want more residential dwellings to be permitted um, through non-hearing building commission or building permit issuances. We want to treat owner occupied duplexes the same as single family homes. We want to address our housing crisis. We know that doing nothing doesn't address the housing crisis. Right now, I saw a um, a statistic or, or a chart today when I was browsing the Mass Housing Partnership website and their data town resources that showed that in the last decade or so, we have basically built um, apartments that house five or more dwelling units on a site or single family homes. We have not built three family homes, we have not built four family homes, and we have not built duplexes. We have a town that is full of single family homes and five or more dwelling units on a parcel. And we are hoping to encourage the building of more than just those two types of dwelling units um, through these zoning changes. Um, <clears throat> And so that's that is the goals as as they are. Uh, just a brief subject on a brief summary of the permitting types. There are four permitting pathways in town, one of which I wouldn't even describe as a pathway because it's a no. Um, if on the use table it says no, you can't build it in that zone. We're going to talk mo mainly about site plan review and special permits today. Those both come with public hearings. They both come with a butter notices. Um, the difference mainly in them are whether the special permits are discretionary and the site plan reviews are essentially a buy right with limited ability to say no to the permit. Um, I want us to think about as we go through this what, what that difference means. With a discretionary permit, under special permit, it means that in that zoning district, we aren't sure whether that use, that proposed use is appropriate in all places of that zoning district. It may be appropriate in some, it may be suitable for some areas, but it may not be suitable for other areas. And therefore we want our permit granting authority to be able to say, you know what, it's not suitable where you've proposed it, we're not going to grant it. With a site plan review permitting pathway, we're saying that that use is appropriate in all areas of that zoning district. And, but, but we want some input into building design, siting, things like that, that you guys did last week as an example at the old hot pot zone. Um, a yes is by right with just as long as you meet all of the conditions, the building commissioner will issue a building permit. A little summary of the residential zones, just to remind us um, what our zones mean. Our RG is our highest density zone and we go all the way down to a low density, low density zone. Um, what does high density mean? What does low density mean? Um, low density in general is up to about five units per acre. High density is about 17 units per acre. Medium density is about 10 units per acre. Do our zones match this? Yes. Um, in fact, they, they tend to fall into the medium and low density zones at all. And this is based on our dimensional table that maxes out, maxes, maxes out our 
dwelling units per acre. And so we just want to keep that in mind that no matter what we permit in a zone for residential uses in these residential zones, you can't have more than, for example, 10 dwelling units on an acre in the general residence because our dimensional table does not allow for more than that at its maximum. And in low density, it doesn't allow more than four units per acre. But in an example, to start a building unit for a dwelling unit in, say, the low density, you need two acres to build the first one. So in actuality, to get to four, you need almost three acres of land. The, there's an issue with the RO and RLD because in the use table, they're in the same category. And so when we talk about what, how we want to, what kind of permitting pathway we want, we need to think about how, while something may not be appropriate in the RLD zone at all, um, if it's appropriate, even in some parts of the RO, we can't put a no in there because then we're not allowed to put it in any of the RO because they're in the same column. It's a quirk of our columns in the use table in section three, but that's how it is. Um, why are we preferencing site plan review? Well, we went through this and we looked at stuff and we asked ourselves questions. Is a, is a use appropriate in that zone? Is it always appropriate in that zone? Should it always be appropriate in that zone? Um, or is it only appropriate in some areas? So those are some of the questions we were asking ourselves. And we came to the conclusion ourselves that most residential uses, at least the ones we're talking about today, are appropriate in most residential zones and therefore should be site plan reviews or even a yes, depending on what they are. Um, the other thing is that special permits are discretionary, so they don't have to be granted, which means that builders um, are reluctant to come into Amherst and ask for them. So we get less applications when there's a special permit required and it provides more uncertainty to a builder. It also drives up costs slightly more than a site plan review would because it takes longer to get through. I've included an example in here and I can talk more about that uh, if there are questions later. But we're, if we're trying to lower housing costs, if we're trying to create more housing, our goal is to create pathways that um, speed up the permitting of that housing because the longer it takes to get a permit, the more costly it is to get a permit, the more the house in the end is going to cost to either rent or purchase because of the costs that went into building it. And so creating less costs on that front end to get to that occupancy um, permit will lower the costs of housing. So let's talk about what we're planning on doing. So with duplexes, this is what a duplex looks like. These are all pictures from our town of duplexes. They are two dwelling units, either vertically or um, horizontally side by side, and they each have to have a separate entrance. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about duplexes. In the zoning districts that are in the business zoning district, we're proposing one change to non-owner occupied duplexes, and that is moving it from special permit to site plan review. And that would then match the owner occupied duplexes and affordable duplexes permitting pathway in that business neighborhood district. And basically what we said was, well, if owner occupied duplexes and affordable duplexes are always appropriate and always suitable for the business neighborhood district, so is a non-owner occupied duplex. Um, it will still require a public hearing and all of that. Um, and it actually max, matches the mixed use building zoning um, pa permitting pathway for that too. In the residential zones, um, we are proposing a number of changes. For owner-occupied duplexes and affordable duplexes, we are proposing to get to permit them under a yes. The only other residential, the only other yeses in the entire zoning bylaw right now are one family detached dwellings and conservation and forestry uses. It was actually on that table about the different permitting pathways. There are very few straight out yeses in our zoning bylaw and one family attached dwelling is one of them. And that is actually what we talk about when we talk about single family only zoning that is exclusionary, that the only building you can build in a zone that does not require a public hearing is a single family home. 
every other type of residential use is excluded from the privilege that a single family home has. And we are trying to create that privilege by adding owner occupied duplexes and affordable duplexes to the yes category. We believe that owner occupied duplexes and affordable duplexes should be treated very similarly to single family homes in this manner. Um, we have actually tried to match, particularly with owner occupied duplexes, if you remember our ADU bylaw. Um, that we just passed that has accessory dwelling units as an accessory use requires just a building permit. There are no public hearings anymore related to creating an ADU, which is two dwelling units on a single property, one of which must be owner occupied. So we looked at that and said, well, that's essentially an owner occupied duplex, although it might look differently. The use is basically the same. So owner occupied duplexes should be yeses. Um, in our bylaw, affordable duplexes have generally been treated the same as owner occupied duplexes, so we made them a yes too, or we are proposing to make them a yes. Non owner occupied duplexes, again, we believe they are suitable for all residential zones, but we want a little more control over them. We want management plans, we want other things, we want a board to be looking at these to make sure that they are managed properly and that they have all the all the correct conditions. And so we're suggesting a site plan review instead of a special permit. I will talk about those SPRs that are in parentheses later on. Duplex conditions, um, they would all, what, what we've put into the bylaw as a proposal is that they would all have to have an exterior footprint compatible with single family dwellings. Owner occupied and affordable duplexes would need a deed restriction. Um, on that to, to have that. And that actually complies and is, is similar to the ADU bylaw that we just passed um, in the, the ADU conditions that ADUs have to have a deed restriction. So we've kept that in here. For owner occupied duplexes, we've put in no other conditions because we are trying to treat them as similarly to single family homes as possible. And single family homes have no other conditions in order to build other than complying with the bylaw. Affordable duplexes and non-owner occupied duplexes would have very similar conditions to ADUs, all of them, and, and potentially even more, management plans, rental permitting compliance, street numbering compliance, dark sky lighting, written decisions, all of that would be required for both of them. And in addition to that, for non-owner occupied duplexes, we've proposed a professional management requirement too. Triplexes. This is a new category in the bylaw, so we'll be talking a little bit more expansively about where what we're proposing, but what is a triplex? We've proposed a definition, since it would be a new use category, it needs a definition of three dwelling units um, arranged vertically one above the other, and two of those dwelling units must share an entrance at ground level. Um, and that is our proposal for it. Um, right now, that type of triplex is considered an apartment. We have not proposed a triplex to include three dwelling units side by side um, on a horizontal sort of attachment because that's considered a townhome right now. And we are planning on keeping that considered a townhome. These pictures, by the way, are of triplexes in Amherst. So we need to talk about all the zoning districts because it's a new use category. And so we are proposing that they not be allowed in the COM, Office Park, Light Industrial, PRP, and FPC zones. That is in, in, in accordance with not just duplexes and single family homes, but also apartments, which are what they are considered right now. In the other business districts, what I consider our business districts, um, right now they are all accepted in all business districts. They're permitted under special permit because they are considered apartments. We are actually proposing to um, not allow triplexes in the BG, BL, and BVC zone um, because those are more businessy and we want higher density in those zones and we want to preference mixed use buildings and retail in those zones. But we are proposing a site plan review use uh, permitting pathway in the BN district to match the owner occupied duplex and affordable duplex current pathways, um, the proposed non owner occupied duplex pathway, and some of the other non and the mixed use building pathway that is currently there. Um, in the residential districts in the RF, we're proposing a no that matches 
pretty much every other use, um, residential use in the RF district. In all of the other districts, we're proposing site plan review. This would match the non-owner occupied duplex proposal that we have and, and recognize that we believe that a triplex, a three-family dwelling is appropriate for all areas of these zoning districts. Um, to give you an example of how much land would be required if a triplex was built in each of these zones, we've included it in here. For example, in our lowest density uh, zone, you would need two and a half acres to put those three dwelling units on that piece of land. But in our highest density zone, our RG zone, you would need just over four tenths of an acre. And it fluctuates in between that. In our RO zone, you would need 1.25 acres. So um, because we believe they are suitable in all areas, we are proposing site plan review. Um, as you can see, since they're considered apartments right now, they're allowed to be built in the RVC by site plan review. The conditions basically mirror the conditions of non-owner occupied duplexes that we've proposed. Um, the management plans, multiple types of management plans, you can see them here, design guidelines, um, extra requirements in an ARP area, and again, exterior appearance and footprint compatible with single family dwellings. These match many of the ADU requirements that um, don't even need a public hearing to build an ADU, and they match most of our requirement, the conditions that we've put into the um, non-owner occupied duplex requirements. Because this is a new use category, this we are proposing revisions to other sections of the zoning bylaw. Um, if we add triplexes as a use category, we are requesting that triplexes be added to the permitted uses for cluster developments, planned unit residential developments, open space developments, and non-conforming lots. Um, those are the summary of where the word and triplexes would be added to those sections. Townhouses. What is a townhouse? So this is three to 10 dwelling units per hour definition in the bylaw, and they each have to have a separate private entrance on the ground level. Again, I've tried to pull pictures of what I believe are townhouses in town. It's it's a hard to find under our, um, under our GIS system, anything actually permitted as a townhouse, but I've tried to pull items that I believe are to give you an idea of what a townhouse might look like. In the business districts, we are proposing um, changes to all the business districts, but in two different directions. So right now, townhouses are permitted. The pathway is a site plan review in the BG and a special permit in all the other business districts, BL, BVC, and BN. We're proposing to switch those. Um, we're proposing to go to special permit in the BG and site plan review in the BL, BVC, and BN. If you remember, um, a year, about two years ago now, I believe, or a year and a half ago, um, the council changed apartments from site plan review to special permit in the BG because we want to favor um, mixed use buildings and retail type developments um, and uses in our densest general business district. And so we um, believe that a townhouse is, since it is does not include any business uses in it, um, should be discretionary in those dis in that district instead of. Um, by right, because we want to, a townhouse does not promote the business use in the business general district. It would match what we did with apartments to preference mixed use buildings over apartments and townhouses. In the BL, BVC, and BN, we are proposing site plan review because we believe that townhouses, one of our denser ways of putting residential uses in areas um, in a way that creates a transitional area from a dense residential, dense business to less dense residential should be preferenced in business areas that are meant to be transitional or more neighborhood-like. And therefore, we believe that site plan review is the appropriate permitting pathway for these areas for townhouses, which can have three to 10 units. Um, in the RG, RVC, and RN districts, um, two different types of plans. Um, in the RVC and RG, remember those are our medium to high, medium high density areas. We're proposing site plan review. Again, these are supposed to be the areas of town that are um, closest to business, closest to commercial, closest to those types of uses that have a more, you know, a, a higher residential use. Townhouses have that higher residential use. They are, we believe, appropriate in all those areas up to that building that is up to 10 units per building. Um, but in the RN zone, 
we're proposing a special permit because we believe they are suitable in some of the RN zone. Um, I'll talk about this more later, but many of our apartment complexes are located in the RN zone. It is, an, it is a zone that is in a various sets of locations located near some um, village centers, but also has a lot of apartment complexes and therefore a townhouse in those areas is entirely appropriate. But in other areas, of the RN zone, it may not be appropriate. And so there we go back to that needing a discretionary review where a, a permitting body can say, you know what, that townhouse house is not appropriate in that area, but it is appropriate in a different part of the area. In the RO and RL district, we're also proposing a special permit as the general permit, again, for the same reason. Uh, while a townhouse may not ever be appropriate in the RLD district, we don't know, you'd have to look at it, but there's one column for both RLD and RO. And if we can say that in parts of the RO district, a townhouse type development may be appropriate, the no that is currently in the zoning bylaw is an inappropriate categorization and permit pathway. A special permit becomes the appropriate pathway. For example, townhomes, can be as low as three dwelling units and three dwelling units in the RO district may be entirely appropriate on a parcel of land, especially in a in a parcel that is close to a village center. I've shown you one of the RO districts in that one of the areas of town that is included in the RO district that is essentially adjacent to a village center. Other parts of town that are in the RO district include Amherst Woods um, and and again, there are parts of Amherst Woods and that area that it may be appropriate to build a three unit townhome or a four unit townhome. But if it's a no, as it currently is now, you can't do it. And so we believe a discretionary approval by the ZBA would be the appropriate pathway for townhouses in the ROLD district. For some references to sizes, um, you would need 4.25 acres in the RLD to build a 10 unit townhouse building you would need two and a half acres to build a three unit townhouse building. And in the RO, you'd need 1.25 acres to build a three unit townhouse building, just to give you some ideas of what type of lot sizes you need for the types under our dimensional table. Conditions, we're not proposing very many changes to the conditions that are currently in the bylaw. Um, the only changes are at the request of the building commissioner who has asked that we replace the permit granting board or special permit granting authority with permit granting authority or building commissioner as applicable. So that's all we've done for the townhouse conditions or all we're proposing. Converted dwellings. What are converted dwellings? Well, they are a building that already exists, that already has a residential unit in it, that is going to be converted to house more residential units. And when that conversion happens, there are already limits on how much new construction can happen with that. In fact, that a, if you are creating a new dwelling unit, that dwelling unit cannot be housed solely in new construction. It must be housed at least partially in a building that already exists. There are other conditions that are important to remember as we talk about converted dwellings. And they are that in the BG, BL, and BVC districts, you cannot exceed six dwelling units for converted dwelling. And in all of our, our residential districts, you cannot exceed four dwelling units in those districts when you are converting a building to a um, more dwelling units. So keep that in mind as we talk about the permitting pathways. The goals of, you know, what do we achieve by this use category, which is more of a um, building category, I would say, than a use category. And it, it achieves the infill development we want from our master plan, creating some density without new construction. Um, it diversifies our housing types. It can convert a single family home to a two family or a three family or a four family in a residential area, creating potentially income diversity in neighborhoods and some types of um, lower cost housing potentially. Um, and it's climate, of, climate supportive. So in the business areas of town, we're proposing in the BL, BVC, and BN to allow converted dwellings by site plan review. We already allow them by site plan review in the BG. And our feeling is that if 
it's appropriate in if it's appropriate to convert a dwelling to more residential units in the BG that's supposed to be our commercial sort of zone for businesses and retail, then it's entirely appropriate in all the areas of BL, BVC, and BN to have a converted dwelling. And so the site plan review is the permitting pathway that should apply um, instead of special permit. Um, in the two densest residential zones, those nearest our business zones, um, we also believe that going up to um, going to a site plan review is the appropriate pathway. Again, you you are limited to a max of four dwelling units, and these are supposed to be our most dense units, dense areas of residential building, and therefore it it it. We believe that, and, and we stand by the fact that we believe that four units is an entirely appropriate use in these most dense areas of our town in terms of what their stated density should be under the definitions in the zoning bylaw. In the RN district, we're also proposing site plan review for these areas. Um, this is a district, as I stated before, that has Brittany Manor, it has the Brook, it has Colonial Village, it has Alpine Commons, it has Puffton Village, it has Brandywine, despite the fact that, as you see on this use chart, apartments technically aren't allowed. Yet this is a district that houses most of our apartment buildings. And so if we're going to have a district that houses many of our apartment buildings in town, we should allow townhouses and converted dwellings to create those neighborhoods that aren't just apartment buildings or single family homes, to create those neighborhoods that have um, income diversity, that have housing choice diversity in terms of what type of housing you want to live in. And doing that by site plan review is, is the best chance we have of creating that type of housing diversity. In the RO and RLD districts, we're also proposing site plan review. Again, there's a max of four. Um, RO and RLD, what do we have in these districts? Uh, we have Amherst Woods, we have Orchard Valley, we have Longmeadow Drive. We also have, dis this district is also adjacent to some of our planned unit residential developments, such as Pulpit Hill Road co-housing and Applewood Community. With a maximum of four dwelling units allowed on a converted dwelling and remembering that this is a building that already exists, um, adding that infill makes a lot of sense to us. So we believe a site plan review is the appropriate permitting pathway. There are conditions, I'm not gonna go through all of these. I just wanna touch on a few things here. The management plan and landscape plans we're proposing deleting, not because they're not necessary, but because those requirements are redundant given the requirement we've added that all conditions for the closest eventual use apply. So as I stated before, converted dwelling isn't really a use, it's more of a building technique, right? You've already got a building there and now you're going to potentially add more housing within that building. And so that building may go from a single family home to actually the equivalent of a duplex or meet the definition of a duplex when it's finished. Well, if it does, it should have to comply with all of the conditions of duplexes. That makes sense to us, it seems logical. And so if it's going to be converted to say a duplex, either the ADU or the duplex conditions should apply. And if it's not going to be owner occupied, the non-owner occupied duplex conditions should apply. All of those conditions require management plans. If it's going to be, be four, five, or six units, depending on where it is, well, then it's an apartment building, potentially a townhome, but more likely considered an apartment building, and all the apartment building conditions should be there. And if those are applied, management plans are required, and therefore restating that management plans are required is just duplicative, and we're trying to eliminate that duplicativeness. We've eliminated the minimum open space requirements in the RL, RL. We've, de we've proposed deleting them, not because they're not necessary um, or a good thing, but because given the dimensional requirements and our dimensional table that requires a maximum uh, lot coverage that in those districts would require, would result in open space that is well above the <laughs> thousand square foot per unit that some of them are required under this, it it's 
in that sense, it becomes not necessary because our dimensional table already builds in those open space requirements. So again, deleting repetitive and duplicative things that are covered other elsewhere in the bylaw. Um, we are requiring public sewer connections for conversions resulting in four or more units too. So what is that aquifer recharge protection district and all those uh, parentheses in the use table? So our aquifer recharge protect protection district is an overlay district in South Amherst um, that protects our Lawrence Swamp aquifer and the water supply wells that are located within the Lawrence Swamp. Um, Portions of Amherst Woods are in it, portions of Stagecoach, Stagecoach Road, Hulst Road are in it, portions of Bay Road are in it. I had to split it up in two so you could see it a little better. Um, at one time, there wasn't really sewer connections in these areas of town, but now with Amherst Woods having sewer been added to the Amherst Woods area, we have areas of town that now have sewer connections and therefore are better able at buildings on those lots are better able to protect the Lawrence swap by being required to connect to sewer. So with that, we thought it was good to revisit that aquifer recharge protection, protection district zoning for dwelling units. Um, we are still proposing that townhouses not be allowed in those areas. They currently aren't allowed, and we are proposing to keep that the same. Um, in converted dwellings, we're proposing a special permit because we need to make sure that the aquifer is protected and four, five, or six, I, I'm not sure there's any business sections of that that could build a converted dwelling, but if there are four, five, or six, we need to make sure that they are connected to sewer. And we need that discretion to say, you know, even if you're connected to sewer, even if this, it's really not appropriate to be putting it so close to our aquifer. But for triplexes, non-owner occupied duplexes, affordable duplexes, and owner occupied duplexes, we're saying a site plan review is appropriate, that that those uses are not much more intense than a single family dwelling when thinking about protecting an aquifer by making sure that they're on sewer or making sure that the septic system is large enough. Right now, one family dwellings are allowed whether or not they're on sewer or septic. Um, in fact, um, affordable duplexes are allowed by special permit in these areas. Um, and so we're just proposing that that get moved to site plan review because we believe it can happen. I've I've highlighted here hostels that are allowed by special permit here, just so you can understand how many beds a hostel is allowed to have that could go in this aquifer recharge protection district um, under special permit, just to give you an idea of how triplexes, duplexes, and all relate to the hostel sort of bed count. Subdividable dwellings. I do not have much to say on this um, because we are deleting it because the building commissioner recommended deleting it. And so he knew we were making these proposals and said, hey, if you're going to do that, could you please propose deleting subdividable dwellings? It has only been used one time since it was enacted. Um, and he made the recommendation. So we followed his recommendation and have proposed deleting it. That is it for now. Um, if there are any questions, we'd love to hear your questions, feedback, and concerns. Thank you so much for sitting through the length of that presentation. All right, thank you, Mandy, Joe, and Pat. Uh, first, I would just want to say this is, you know, you've obviously spent a lot of time on this, and um, it's a bold proposal in the context of the town and the politics. So uh, thank you for stirring the pot a bit. Um, and, and I'm sure you already realize that there's all kinds of people that have comments on this. Um, so my, I want to start by asking, um, you know, about a year ago, we got the solar moratorium proposal from town council. And we, we, we deliberated about it without really proposing any changes. We kind of did an up or down you know, do we recommend it as received from town council or not? Can you still hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm seeing my video just going crazy all the time. So I'm gonna just turn that off for a while. Um, but anyway, uh, I guess my first question is, uh, is it your, will you be open to the planning board proposing changes to this and recommending it with changes? rather than limiting ourselves to an up or, up or down on what you've given us. 
the the short answer is yes. Um, we would like to be involved in those discussions, obviously. Um, but yeah, we understand this is very bold um, and that you guys are keepers of the master plan um, and have your own ideas. And we definitely want to have a conversation with you where we may be open. We are open to potential changes, um, but we'd like to have that as a as sort of a collaborative conversation more than just do this type thing, but yes. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, so with that, uh, I think the board, um, and I'm assuming that Pat doesn't want to say anything at this point. Uh, we're trying to limit no, your no, energy really. tonight. I think Mandy covered it, and I want to thank you for your time and also for being patient with me. Okay. All right. So why don't we go ahead and entertain questions and at least questions from the board. We might want to hold comments maybe later, uh, but uh, Andrew, why don't you start? You've got your hand up. Thanks, Doug. Um, Thanks, uh, Mandy, Joan, Pat, for this presentation. I, I echo everything Doug said. I, I, I would just add this was like an incredibly logical approach to doing things. Like I really was impressed by, um, by how that was sort of carried through in your proposal in terms of just the the idea of residential uses should be allowed in residential areas, right? Like it, I think you did a great job of summarizing that, and. I think on paper, there's there's actually, I mean, I've got some minor questions, but there's there's not a lot actually that I that I dispute or have uh, concerns about um, in terms of the spirit of this. But one of the things we talked about last week, and I'd love to get your thoughts on, is um, how would you respond to folks who feel that you know these these proposals might incense more um non-owner occupied kind of investment um entities coming in and developing housing which which ends up being scooped up at above market rents by you know people who are able to pay that most notably students i think that's that's what i've been hearing from folks is that um in spirit it's great in practice it might actually not solve the problem, it might exacerbate a problem of having affordable housing for, for folks. Um, we don't know what it'll do, right? You, zoning is a is a, a goal, right? Um, and our goal is to promote opportunities to build housing. You'll notice that we did not include non-owner occupied duplexes as the yes we put that as a site plan review. That was a specific choice that of the only things that would be an absolute yes without um, without public hearings would be owner-occupied duplexes by deed restriction, the same that we did with ADUs recently that this board promoted and, and um, supported, and affordable duplexes, which when we looked at the use table and when we looked at how we were treating them in our zoning bylaw were treated nearly identical to owner-occupied uses. Those are things that could go just to the building inspector, and those would promote the things that we talk about wanting to promote, housing opportunities for home ownership, housing opportunities for low income individuals, because those affordable duplexes would have a deed restriction to be on the affordable housing inventory, uh, the state housing inventory. Um, beyond that, we're asking you, the planning board, to be the main permit granting authority in most of this stuff. We believe you can do your job well um, and that some of that may be able to potentially lower some housing costs. We don't know, though, what investors or any other um, builder or owner in town will do with these. Um, I, I think that's the best I can do right now. Um, we'll take your question and see if we can come up with um, some other answers and maybe some some information beyond that. Okay, yeah, I mean, uh, I appreciate that. I would say that it, it would be worth the research and the effort because I think that is maybe what, what folks are wrestling with is just, is it actually gonna do what we think it's gonna do? Um, uh, and then I'll just close again with uh, kind of how Doug led in. I love the bold proposal. Uh, incredibly logical. I love what you're trying to do. And, you know, I, I hope we continue these conversations. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Bruce, looks like you got your hand up next. 
Actually, I think Karen had her hand up before me. Well, I yeah, for a while she was up. Uh, Karen, um, would you okay. like to go next? Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mandy Jo. Thank you, Pat. Um, I've got a few comments, but I'll hold those for the moment. I see Doug's uh, gone. Uh, I'm not gone. Again. <laughs> <laughs> um, the one question that springs to mind for the moment, and, and I, I'm, it may be a question for Chris, uh, but it could be either of you, uh, uh, Chris, uh, Christine Brasco. Um, we we seem to be shifting a, a fair amount of uh, work from the zoning board to the planning board, and uh, because uh, and so I'm just wondering, um, does, has has there been any consideration to whether this board is going to have its uh, evenings uh, extended even later because we get loaded with uh, a, a dose, of, you know, a noticeable increase in. Uh, in, in workload, has that been a concern? Uh, has that been uh, thought about, asked? You're you're what asking Mandy Jo making? in terms of crafting this bylaw change. I'm I'm asking Chris Act anybody who uh, because it, as I see this, there's a lot of uh, uh, work that's been shifted from the zoning board to the planning board. Now we already meet you know, three to four hours, well, in, in, the, in the six months that I've been on, I can only speak from that point of view. Locally, uh, involved, sir. Yeah, okay, okay, good luck. I don't know whether that's an answer, but anyway, it seems that we're already pretty busy. And my concern is, has does anybody know whether this is gonna make uh, uh, life miserable for the planning board? Well, I see, uh, Chris, do you wanna comment on that? Or Mandy Joe even? You know, I mean, certainly it could make it worse. Um, Chris, yeah, I see your hand. Well, I haven't really considered um, that question, but I would say it is going to put more work on the planning board and um, that would just have to be absorbed. But one thing I've thought as I've been reviewing this um, proposal is that it doesn't have to come all at once. It could be phased and there may be aspects of it that you want to try first and see how they work and then if they work well move on to the next phase and so that might give us a better sense of how much um, work is being uh, transferred from the zoning board of appeals to the planning board just a suggestion all right chris i guess the other thing that occurred to me is if we were really concerned about that we could make some more things yeses and they would just go straight to construction. <laughs> All right, we, uh, Bruce, what? Uh, or we could keep them. Right, uh, keep it the, just the, the way it is. Yep. Keep it the way it is. Uh, okay. I'm not necessarily advocating that. I'm just curious at this point. And uh, um, and I have another question, but I'll 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 take. Go ahead, one. Bruce. You've got the floor. Okay, Karen. Yeah, so this is um, such a thorough and a detailed proposal, and I applaud you. I, it took me hours and hours and hours to study, and I can just imagine the time it took you to formulate it and to, um, and I applaud the effort and the motivation. However, I think this issue is so complex that I, it's a little bit what Chris said, I think we should go forward in small increments, assessing each change really separately because each change has its own repercussions and uh, which we may not yet have considered. And I think it's important to listen to those that are gonna be affected in each case, both the developers and uh, the residents. So, it, you know, you can't get your head, there, there were certain elements that I, thought, yes, that sounds really reasonable, but I do think that all those elements also have their own people. And we're, we're hearing more and more the residents are very frustrated if those that are affected can't really weigh in on things. Now, uh, so I propose that this has to be very incremental. That's one of my biggest concerns. And the other concern, because repercussions are uh, things as the person Darcy Dumont said, it's very hard to assess ahead of time who's going to take advantage of uh, loosening of 
restrictions. And we are basically in danger of really losing a lot of um, residents and diversity simply because we haven't got, we haven't yet discussed safeguards that are, are going to be in place to protect us from uh, the financial pressures of investors being able to milk student rentals and just be able to get everybody out of the market. In even a duplex, you can have an owner occupied duplex a developer or, or an investor from out of town will buy it at a price that nobody else can afford and put a lot of students in. That's, that's a problem. And I would like, I actually think we need to have a huge conversation. It comes up again and again. You see it everywhere. You see neighborhoods that are, be, that are deteriorating so that the town is no longer the place that we want, walkable, bikeable, livable, with little children that are gonna fill our schools because of these pressures. So I think we really need to talk about safeguards first before we loosen a lot of restrictions so that we prevent that. Safeguards such as having a different property tax structure as they do in Cambridge for owner-occupied housing, having perhaps a limit on the amount of student rentals you can have in a block because it's not that students are bad, but when they're in the majority, they drive up out other people, not just financially, but just because the kind of litter, the kind of noise, the kind of sort of uh, just, you know, run down atmosphere that often comes. I would like to ask if any of you have gone on a Sunday morning through the neighborhood in Allen Street and seen how disgusting it is. It's floor to floor litter beer bottles. And you can only imagine what it was like on Saturday night. So any family with little children, they can afford to live there perhaps, but they're not going to. And those safeguards are something that we need to talk about, I think, first. All right, thanks, Karen. Uh, Tom. Thanks, Doug, and thanks, Mandy, Joe, and Patricia. I, I, you know, I, I think I agree with a lot of what was said already, so I'm not going to um, spend too much time on it. I do think this is really complex in the sense that there are a lot of variables here, and I find it hard to be like to to offer a thumbs up across the board. I think there's also a lot of other implications where if we want certain outcomes, that simply changing something from an SP to an SPR is not going to actually get that result without some other changes in the bylaws. So I think there's other things that we need to be considered in this process. And then I think one of the other things that should should be studied um, is adjacencies. And I know you've done some work on that, where you know what's next to um, a village center, et cetera. But when I look, when I when I think about this on a map. Are we potentially creating large swaths or zones that can become all two, three, four, five family houses um, because of certain kinds of adjacencies? Can, are we creating a kind of tendency in certain zones to have more of something than other? So if we're not seeing it on a map and we're just seeing certain zones, I think certain areas of our town lend themselves certain kinds of um, uses that we may or may not want versus other parts. And so I'm not sure if this is just a straight up RG versus RVC. I think there might actually be specific places where these are more appropriate and less appropriate. And I think we need to see some adjacencies to know um, or to see this in context, to see this mapped out a little bit, um, whether they're examples, whether they're um, you know maps to show us what's changing here you know, from one, one um, SP to SPR. Um, so I, I guess that said, I, I don't necessarily have a, a specific problem as of yet, but I feel like there's still a lot of questions that I have about it um, because I don't see all the facts and I don't see all the uh, additional considerations um, that could actually make this work the way you want it to. I agree with the goals and I agree with a lot of what's going on. I just don't necessarily see it all adding up just yet. So this is my thoughts. Okay, thanks, Tom. All right, I don't, uh, Janet. So I, I am interested in everybody's comments and I agree with a lot of what people are saying. Um, so I just have 
you know, I have a million questions about the specifics, but I don't know that this is the meeting for it. But, you know, I think if the goal is to create moderate housing for moderate income people and families, um, or moderately mo people with moderate incomes who don't have families, or create some, you know, places for people to have a multi unit house, um, I think it's going to be I think there's there's a bunch of issues to me is will that happen and we're in a college town and I feel like this proposal sort of forgets that 70% or so of the people in our community are students and there's this supercharged kind of student housing market that the prices are just you know beyond, like astronomical what people are paying now I mean it kind of beats Boston some of the um, new apartment buildings um, we do see investors in you know neighborhoods like mine buying up houses. Um, I see properties on the MLS as investors take note, um, letting them convert those kind of properties to multifamily housing. It's going to be multi-student housing when people are paying 850 up to 1500 per per bed, not necessarily even a bedroom. And so. Um, you know, developers are maximizing their investment and they're not looking to build a cheap duplex. In fact, in fact, I, I doubt any affordable duplexes. I don't know if any have been built in the last bunch of years. Um, there was a NoHo developer who bought a lot in a, you know, sort of a regular neighborhood and built two $600,000 condos that were in a duplex and sold them. So in that market, how do you get your goal? And I'd be interested in seeing, like, looking at other college towns that have managed to create space for sort of regular folk. And I, I hear from UMass professors that they can't get faculty to come here because there's not, the housing is too expensive, staff can't afford to live here. Um, so I, I, I think the impacts of student housing will be greatest in the neighborhoods that are the most diverse in terms of ethnicity, income, you know, I know lots of, of the small kind of 60s housing developments in South Amherst have been turning. I know North Amherst, Amherst is, you know, that's all, you know, they're kind of gone. And, and so I don't think we're protecting or helping the groups of people we want to. Um, I think the expensive neighborhoods with kind of expensive housing are going to be the least likely to convert. And so the, I think that, you know, sometimes you want to treat everything the same. And it has an it has different impact in reality, um, as millions of years of civil rights law have showed us. Um, so the the other question I had is, and I ask this always with zoning changes, what was the purpose of this? You know, when we look at the the use chart, and we look at the permitting pathways, we look at the protections for how the designs will look, and we look at the extra thousand square feet per unit. Why did town meeting vote that? Why did the planning department vote, you know, support that? Why did the select board say yes? And so what's the history behind that? Because surely the zoning board of appeals is doing something. It was asked to do something for a reason. And I'd love to know those reasons. And, you know, you could say, well, this is a random chart. It's illogical, but it's really not. People made decisions, you know, hundreds of people made this decision and they were, so I'd, I'd like to know the history of, why, why pick SP over SPR versus the building commissioner in these different um, types of housing? Um, and then the other question I always ask is, what does maximum build out look like? And so when you talk about 10 house, townhouses being built on a property, um, you know, in RO or RLD or RN, um, people might consolidate lots and build 10 town, townhouses. We can waive height requirements. We can add stories. What will that look like? And what is the impact on the neighborhood in RR and RLD? You're trying to protect sensitive lands, wetlands, you know, natural areas, farmlands. I'm not sure you want to have 40 people living in 10 townhouses next to a farm because that's a lot of conflict in terms of use. It's noise, it's lights, it's going to have impacts on wildlife. So, you know, let's get some pictures of what this would look like in an RN or an RLD or RO and think, oh, that's what we want. And that's actually kind of what we asked this, the Zoning Board of Appeals to do. We're asked to do is to look at what someone's proposing. And I think both boards put a lot of time and effort into 
landscaping plans, how it fits, how it looks. Sometimes you might think this is crazy picky, but we're trying to make it look better. And I think the boards are really doing similar work. And so I'm not quite sure why shifting from one board to the other is good. I definitely think dropping design guidelines and increasing density without a big conversation is not good. So those are kind of like big, kind of big issues, but I do have lots of questions about very specific things that I will spare us for right now. Okay, Janet, thank you. Bruce, I see your hand again. Yes, uh, I, I, I had a lot of comments, but I wasn't, uh, uh, but now that we're into the commentary, um, uh, the, the, the very first thing that uh, crops up with me, uh, Mandy, Joe, and Pat, is one of your uh, sta uh, stated goals is that uh, this will help achieve affordability. And, and it really, my question to myself was, how does changing the bylaw in these ways contribute to uh, increasing affordability? And, 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 but I think I know the answer to that and that, that is that it won't and it doesn't uh, because there's a, a saturated market here. And uh, all of the concerns that have been expressed uh, uh, related to student occupations and, and their effect on neighborhoods. And I see it too, next to my daughter's house, people parking on their lawns. It's a real, real problem. So I, I, I see what you're doing. I understand it makes sense to me in many ways, uh, particularly the idea of turning the by right, uh, giving the by right uh, requirement of uh, possibilities to duplexes and affordable du uh, owner occupied and affordable duplexes. But it seems to me to achieve this goal of, um, of, of more affordable and more um, neighbor housing, that it the, the this the, this change or these changes to the bylaw um, would need to be accompanied by some additional changes uh, or, or not even changes but newly enacted requirements uh, along the lines that uh, Karen was suggesting that will um, I mean the idea of if it's Possible, I suppose it is to uh, increase the the property tax payments for properties that are occupied by um, you know, non-family uh, renters would seem to be um, a good idea because in order to uh, keep the neighborhoods uh, that are, that grow um, uh, salubrious, I think we're going to need a lot more John Thompsons, the um, who I guess is the person at town hall who, who looks after. Uh, rental housing, among other things, and uh, and John's already overwhelmed. I think we know that. Um, and and how do we pay for more? Uh, and and well, the answer from to my point of view is from my point of view is that the 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 the, the types of housing that are generating the need for the John Thompsons should pay for the John Thompsons. So there should be some kind of supplementary, additional, or complementary enactments here that would offset the problems or the unintended consequences, but it would seem to me to be the obvious consequences of, of some of these. I don't think uh, by right duplexes and affordable duplexes are, are in this category, but, but the further you go down the charts uh, through maybe triplexes and then into uh, townhouses in certain places, I think it's clear that there are going to be uh, consequences that are, are uh, that, that, that we, we, we should be paying attention to if we, uh, if we move with this kind of expansion or change or easing of the permit. So um, the um, blah, 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 um, particularly in the non-owner occupied uh, categories here, I think we should be thinking of complementary additional uh, bylaws to safeguard against what would seem to me to be the obvious quote unquote unintended consequences. Um, and I do like the idea of phased adoption because that would allow this to happen because some of this stuff would seem to be obvious or not obvious, but uh, um, worthy. Um, I know, for example, that in Pine Street co-housing here where I live, where uh, achieved a, a whole lot of duplexes uh, by special permit 30 years ago. Every time we want to 
add to the building or do something, and we do quite a lot because we're an industrious bunch of people here, we have to trouble the zoning board because once you've got a special permit, uh, you're tied to uh, it in certain ways. So uh, uh, by right, uh, 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 permitting of duplexes would uh, um, uh, make my life a lot, our life here a lot easier and it will make the lives of the people who live in them. So that's another benefit really that, that, that attaches to making them by right. So I'm, I'm uh, supportive of the, uh, of the first uh, couple of rows of this, absolutely. And then it gets a little more concerning as we go down in, and, and, and I think it needs to be complemented in the way I just mentioned. Um, um, that's it for me for the moment. Thank you. I, I do understand that this is a huge amount of work and, and then when you stick your head up, uh, pop it through a hole, there's gonna be people like me who think, oh, that's a good target for my rotten tomato, so let's have a shot. And I really don't want it to be like that, but I do have these concerns and I think there I am not alone here. All right, thanks, Bruce. Mandy, I see your hand. You uh, probably have wanted to respond maybe or comment on some of I, Bruce's comments. I, I would like to respond to, to some of the comments, um, particularly around the tax proposals and, and the inspector issue um, to, to sort of give the planning board um, an update on some of where that work, where the council is doing some of that work. For the last couple of years, the council has actually looked at um, that owner-occupied exemption um, in the tax rate and has concluded that it would do more harm. It, it would not, it would not achieve the goals people hope it would achieve when looking at what the tax assessors, the assessor's office produces for the council for that it would increase by a large margin the taxes on non-owner occupied parcels, including all of the um, apartment complexes as well as everything else to an extent that the rents in all of those non-owner occupied parcels would probably increase dramatically above the high rents they are now so that it would actually make it more unaffordable to rent in town than it already is, which would not necessarily accomplish a, a goal of creating more affordable housing. So the council has actually declined to do that the last two years. That's not to say it would not, do, it, that's not to say it will always make that same decision, but the last couple of years it has declined to um, apply an owner occupied exemption to the tax to the tax rate. Um, as for inspectors and all of those other um, issues related to quiet enjoyment around housing and neighborhoods, the Community Resources Committee has been working for the past year on redoing and revamping the rental registration bylaw. Um, and it has recently added, uh, with a referral from the council, the public, the nuisance house bylaw, which we are renaming the public nuisance bylaw. Um, that work is ongoing. It is almost complete to refer back to the council for action um, and, and possible recommendation um, in a way that we hope um, as a CRC, one of the goals is to address the issues regarding disruptions of quiet enjoyment in neighborhoods through the rental permitting and public nuisance bylaws, um, including the raising and charging of fees for the rental permitting process that would allow the um, increase in the number of inspectors in town in a way that would um, allow us to move from a solely complaint driven inspection system to a more proactive inspection system. So that work is ongoing. So that's sort of a, a I, I wanted to let the planning board know about that work because it's been mentioned a couple times here that, that the council is addressing that type of um, that, that particular part of the issues we as a town have been having and is attempting to address some of that through the rental permitting bylaw and the work the CRC is doing with that bylaw. Um, so I just wanted to mention some of that. Thank you. Thank you, Mandy Jo. Uh, next hand, and by the way, I see four board members with comment with hands raised. So uh, it sounds like we'll have a good long conversation tonight. Uh, Janet, you are next. 
So um, I think um, I think Thomas is talking about this, but I'm not sure. I don't want to put words in his mouth. I think one of the issues is, you know, regardless of where the zoning district is, um, you know, putting more density or allowing more density in different zoning districts or, you know, depending on where in the town will have different impacts. And so one of the concerns I had with this was sprawl. It's like if if there are you know, many more multi-unit houses in all parts of town or townhouses, um, you know, that is sprawl. That's traffic on the road. That's, you know, kind of what we've all been fighting against. And it's it's also what the master plan is trying to fight against, which is calling for density in village centers and town center. Um, and then when you add density, which this will, is to have strict design standards to make sure it's respecting the historic look. Um, and it says that like a million times, and I can send you these different memos that I kind of summarize that. It also, the master plan and also the housing market study tell us or ask us to address the question of student housing. And they see the impacts of student housing on neighborhoods as a very potentially negative thing. And I think we do have to address that. The other question I had, which I picked up this very large complicated proposal is, you know, Mandy Jo, you're the chair of the CRC, like, it would make sense to me that you would bring that to the CRC and have people work through it and do the research that we've been asking for. Is there a reason why you didn't work through the committee or, you know, is the CRC going to do an impacts analysis and a build out? Are they going to kind of go through things, things by thing? Because I'd be happy to work on that too. But it's, you know, it's such a massive proposal. I just wondered why you didn't bring it to your committee. Andy? Um, I am the chair of CRC, and I have been for a while, but that uh, chairmanship is never guaranteed. But I came into my term um, uh, with a goal of making a proposal regarding duplexes when I talked to Councillor DeAngelis and actually Councillor Miller, who was not on CRC, about my uh, thoughts regarding increasing housing in town. They wanted to work with me on this, um, and we were working on it for a while. Um, within that time, CRC has been referred the rental permitting um, through work that a number of us counselors were doing um, in a similar manner to what Pat, I, and Michelle were doing with this proposal. Um, when that was brought to the council early on, it was referred to um, CRC. Zoning is a little interesting because we haven't quite figured out how that works within the state law that requires hearings within certain amounts of time. Um, so I, I would say that's that's one little hiccup in whether CRC through a proposal by a counselor can work with without the um, state law zoning requirements, uh, hearing requirements kicking in immediately. Um, this is now going to CRC, just like it's at planning board now for the hearing and recommendation. Um, as chair, I will be scheduling, I believe on February 16th, our first look at this matter will, will happen as CRC. Um, for it, I expect a collaborative process there too, just like I, I responded to Doug's initial question of, we would like a collaboration. Um, you know, the council is still an, a newish form of government. We're still trying to figure out as counselors and as planning board and as CRC, how legislative matters work when counselors have um, ideas and want to make proposals. We're allowed to do that. and. Councillor DeAngelis and I, and at one point, Councillor Miller, were making this proposal. Um, Councillor Miller had to withdraw from her sponsorship um, for her own reasons. And so here we are, and I'm hoping we can have that collaborative discussion, not just with the planning board, but with CRC. Yeah, and I just want to throw in, we're also going to be meeting with the uh, uh, housing uh, trust, because we feel like this is uh, would also impact affordable housing in Amherst. Um, and so we're really trying to find a way to create, a, in a sense, a flow between all these committees so that we can create the best um, zoning changes that will really support the development of new housing in Amherst that addresses, you know, that, that limits socioeconomic uh, segregation and stuff, which we have had consistently in this town for years. And one of the, and that that's enough said right now. 
Okay, thanks, Pat, and thanks, Mandy. Janet, are you set for the moment? Can we go to Bruce? Um, no, I appreciate that. I really do believe in the mixed neighborhoods, and you know, I feel like I live in one, and I I, I want to make sure that continues and spreads. But so. Okay, thank you, Janet. Uh, Bruce, you are next. Um, I just want to uh, pitch a little further on this uh, notion of uh, um, some kind of tax, uh, elevated tax on non-owner occupied, uh, particularly student, uh, uh, non-family occupied uh, uh, housing. I, I, I didn't uh, I, I watch or I'm not familiar with the council's deliberation on that matter, uh, uh, Mandy Jo, but it would seem to me that what you reported would be exactly what you would want to happen, that you put a slightly higher tax onto that site, that category of housing. Um, the rental, uh, if you just simply add it onto the existing rental, yes, the, the, the rates, uh, the rental does go up. It becomes uh, um, uh, more than the market can bear. Uh, the rentals are therefore reduced. Uh, the uh, uh, investors cannot get quite so much out of their houses, uh, therefore they don't capitalize to the same extent, and therefore, as a direct consequence of that, the uh, they don't pay as much for the houses, and therefore, uh, people who want to buy them are not so easily bid out of the market. So, I would say what the, the, you report the council's reasons for not doing this would be the exact opposite of what they should be thinking here, um, because it should have exactly the consequence that I just reported. I mean, logically, I, we, we don't really know these things, but from a simple economic standpoint, that would seem to be the outcome and that's what we're trying to achieve, I think. All right, Bruce, I, I gotta say, I think one of the collaterals of that situation is that rents would go up for people who may not be able to afford them. And that seems to be what Mandy Jo was saying was undesirable from the council's point of view. Uh, you mean that, the, that it would be more difficult for students to... Uh, yeah, or, or anyone. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah. because, the, because the, uh, the tax increase would not relate to unrelated, uh, uh, to related uh, 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 renters or owners. Uh, I think probably I should give it a miss for the moment, but I can I can I can refine my argument better on this. What I think it's trying to do. Am okay, I, is my hand down. Yes, it is. Okay, thanks, uh, Karen. You are next. So I was going to say exactly <laughs> the same thing that Bruce was because uh, what we have to what what we have to brainstorm. Uh, all of us that we all want the same thing. We want diverse, affordable, uh, mixed use downtown. I agree it should be denser. I, I like a lot of the ideas in the proposal, but we have to find a way that uh, that owners that are, are buying a house can compete with other people that are going to divide it up and rent it out as hard as for as high prices as possible. If uh, we charge those investors a lot of money and they raise the rent, their units are going to be out of the market, so to speak. People will go to the others. And uh, what, what we want is to make it not so much more desirable to be an investor to come in and buy something that that nobody else can compete, and there has to be a solution for that. There somehow has the the free market is not safeguarding us. So to make it um, easier and easier to dissect and and build apartments, and then have this be more and more of a market where investors come in and and milk it, um, you know maybe that's a free market kind of thing but you're going to lose you're going to lose this town and that you once it's gone it's gone you can see other university towns where the students have taken over and even if you want to live in town it's just kind of slummy gone are the flower beds gone are the individual people that care a lot 
gone are the fa you're not going to have children there. So we have to find those safeguards. Um, and um, you know, have you thought what besides uh, raising the price for non-owner occupied? What what other solutions are there that you thought of, perhaps? Okay. Tara, and I think if some, you know, if you have ideas, we'll want to hear those too. Uh, Tom, you are next. Thanks. I'll be brief. Um, I think I'm trying to trying to get to the bottom of this notion of affordable housing and whether we're talking about capital A or lowercase a affordable housing. Um, and I, I guess I have a question about. I, I, I understand the argument you're putting forth about how we get to affordable housing by streamlining the process and taking out expenses and that makes the cost of those units, unit production cheaper and so on. But I think, you know, when it comes to this notion of, uh, you know, um, economic and, um, and ethnic and cultural diversity, you know, I think there are a lot of questions that come out about whether or not the zoning amendment went far enough that we already had about affordable housing that was focused primarily on one kind of building. Um, if we want to bring diversity and uh, affordable housing of, of any kind, um, I think we need to have another amendment that actually addresses maybe triplexes. Maybe there's a responsibility for people to do that, and maybe the town subsidizes that, but I don't think you're going to get it just by streamlining the process. I don't think it's going to achieve those goals that you have unless there's something more substantial that we're able to put in place, which is some kind of amendment, some kind of subsidies, and some kind of support by the actual town of Amherst to make, to make those things happen, to put this diversity of housing types into these neighborhoods and make them actually affordable rather than just making them more student housing or more... Um, upper upper middle class housing. So so I think we need to find a way to piggyback some other kinds of amendments for strategies on top of this. And like I said, I don't think this is going to go far enough to get you where you want to go without something else changing within what we're doing here in Amherst. Okay, thank you, Tom. Um, Mandy and Pat, I saw your hands during the last couple of people uh, and. Some of them went up and some of them went down. So Pat, your hand is up at the moment. Why don't you, if you want to- Yeah, I'm gonna to try to limit what I say. Um, okay. My working class background is rising. Um, uh, one of the things that I keep hearing from many, many people is students, 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 rental, the developer, it's gonna, it's gonna skyrocket the cost. I have lists of people that I work with on, in the Amherst mobile market. Um, who are renting apartments in Amherst. And every one of the ways that we, um, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out polite ways to say some of this. Uh, basically, it seems to me that we are forgetting that all renters are not students. They are not. And four unrelated family members can be living to get um, foreign unrelated people can be living together who are not students. And every time I hear this, well, we're, you know, put it on the developer, put her on the developer. And, and I think they can probably afford it, but where it's going to go to keep their income going, their income soaring, is on the tenants who are in need. And I'm really tired of losing people like Glennis and her family or Johanny or, you know, we need to broaden our attitude about who a renter is. And yes, do we know any of what we're creating is gonna work magically the way Mandy and I would like it? No, but what we have has been generated by the bylaws and zoning limitations that we have. So taking a risk around um, changing some of the exclusionary zoning, which is really what this is trying to address, really does open up the possibility for uh, young families because they're building smaller and they're sharing and they're taking up less land. I have a couple of friends of ours who built a duplex in Pelham many years ago. 
and they uh, raise their children there. Their children have graduated and gone out into the world and now they're aging in place in the home that these two families came together on their own and said, we wanna buy this land and we wanna build this duplex because that made it affordable for them. So there, you know, we talk about so many things, but let's not lose some of the uh, benefits that would come environmentally and economically for making some of these changes. Of course, it's a risk. Doing nothing, keeping it as it is, is a bigger risk. Thank okay. you. I'm sorry Thank I'm ranting. Pat. I need medication soon. <laughs> no, I, thanks for sticking with us. All right, um, I don't see any more hands at the moment, so I'll uh, just mention some of the comments and questions that I had. Um, first, I was, uh, and the first, this is uh, just kind of wondering, you know, would it make sense for us to talk about splitting, adding a column to our chart and splitting the RO and the RLD? Um, and I was also struck that we don't actually have a multifamily residential zone. Our, our densest <coughs> zone in town is RG, single family. I mean, that seems ridiculous to me. Um, and, you know, in a town where we have a lot of students and they're perfectly happy to live in multifamily buildings, maybe we ought to have some, you know, have a, an apartment zone or whatever we want to call it. Um, Mandy, I have a specific question about the deed restrictions for affordable duplex and owner-occupied duplex. What actual restriction would you be proposing? And how would it be, what's the mechanism for creating it if it's, if it's not through a board or a hearing? You are um, muted. There you go. The the language we've put in the proposal is the exact language that went into the um, ADU section of the bylaw. Um, so whatever we used for the ADUs is the language we've put in for this, um, except we changed the language slightly for the affordable one in terms of what the deed restriction would need to be, which is on a state housing inventory instead of owner occupancy. Um, but the language itself matches the language in the accessory dwelling part of the accessory uses section of our bylaw, which I think is article five, if I've got the zoning article right on accessory uses. Um, and so I, I believe it's just something that needs to be recorded in the registry of deeds at the Hampshire County Registry of Deeds, and that's part of the language. Um, and so okay. it would need to be recorded and proven or the, or the um, use permit would be pulled. Okay, so Chris or Nate, who originates that deed restriction language. Where is it? It's in the ADU section of the bylaw, um, and it is required in order for the uh, building commissioner to grant a building permit to build an ADU. So who, drafts, who drafts it? Does the applicant draft it, or do the you applicant the town? draft it, but we also have a template. Um, and Rob Mora has that template, and he's used it a number of times, and he feels that it works pretty well. Um, okay. He developed it, but he, you know, passed it by our uh, attorneys, and um, so it's it's working well so far. Okay. All right, um, Mandy. Next about triplexes. Say I have a duplex with one unit on top of the other one, and I want to add another unit next door. Is that a tri a triplex or not? If it's not vertically stacked, what is a three unit? building with one on top of the other and one next door. Is that an apartment? So it wouldn't be an apartment because you have to have at least four units. Um, if you're adding something like that, it would be considered a converted dwelling um, under our table. And then Rob, as the building commissioner, would make a determination under our proposal. Um, is that converted dwelling more closely related to a townhome or a triplex? Okay. Um, in terms of figuring out which conditions would apply in that sense. Um, but if it already exists, it would be a converted dwelling. If it's a new building, um, 
if I am channeling Rob correctly, he would look at that and make a determination as to whether um, it's more closely related to a townhome or a triplex definition because we don't have a zoning bylaw that if it's not covered, you can't do it. If it's not covered, he matches it to the closest use. I think it would depend on whether there is a shared entrance or whether there are three separate entrances. Okay, that's good. Yep. Um... And then where do row houses fit into our zoning? Are they allowed at all? I mean, you know, if we had a 10 family or a 10 unit townhouse, but it was actually split where, you know, each person wanted to own each unit, is that even allowed? Chris? Um, we don't consider ownership in our zoning bylaw. Um, ownership is a separate thing. So if each person wanted to own a unit, I think it would be a condominium, but that would be dealt with outside of the zoning bylaw. Okay. And obviously we would need to change the dimensional requirements to allow you to actually own your land under your building and not make it condo, just make it an individual row house you own. All right. Uh, well, I guess the only other thing I'll say at the moment is uh, kind of in contrast to Bruce, who said he liked the first couple of rows, I think I like the first couple of columns. And I think the reason is, uh, I'm, uh, I think like Janet mentioned, um, increasing the density along in, in the uh, downtown and village centers is something I'm very interested in. I'm less interested and in fact, probably not necessarily supportive of increasing density in outlying areas that are, that are far from major roads that probably have a bus route on them um, because I'm not interested really in creating more property owners who have to rely on uh, a private vehicle to get to, to live their lives. Um, so if I were to you know, be consulted about how we might phase it in, uh, I might say, you know, we would do it in village centers, do it downtown, uh, maybe within a thousand feet of a major road um, and some, you know, within a distance, somebody could walk to a bus line um, and then uh, hold off or maybe never uh, increase the allowances in outlying areas. All right, so I don't see any more hands at the moment. Um, I know this is not a public hearing, but we have nine out public attendees and I just wanted to give them a chance um, to make uh, a brief comment. So uh, Pam, why don't we set the clocks for two minutes? And uh, I got a lot of pushback last time on one minute and uh, several people ran over. So we will allow public comment for two minutes. And before we do that, I see Pat, your hand. So why don't yeah, you make I, your comment? Well, I really respect public comment. I am going to leave the meeting. It, I can't keep doing this. Okay. Again. Thank you. Well, very, thank you very for joining us. You. Okay, uh, I see one hand from the public. Um, if we could bring Hilda Greenbaum over. Hilda, give us your name, give us your address as always. Oh, and I'm 298 Montague Road in North Amherst. And I have a bunch of comments that I've made. They may not be in any particular logical order because they sort of follow the discussion here. I'm gonna start, I think, with an editorial in yesterday's Globe about Governor Healy is really pushing hard. She and also um, Mayor Wu in Boston, pushing really hard for finding housing for people that are homeless as well as middle income people. And, um, and I, I agree with, with Karen and with Bruce and, and others who have said we really need to bring the middle class back here, especially if we want to improve our schools back to the way we were. We need more school kids and in the high school particularly. So I'm speaking from my more than 60 years of knowing the real estate market in this town and also my six years as an assessor and my eight years as a zoning board member. Um, 
some of the things I would like to say is that you, when you come up here to the RO area, we're all on septic, which limits the density because you got to have enough room for the septic fields for each unit or bigger ones if it's more than, I think septic systems sizes are based on the number of bedrooms, number of people who can live in the house. So that's one issue when they are all up here. And I don't know how many people are, are, are on town water either up here in RO and RLD, but you also have to have a certain distance between the water supply and the, and the septic system. Um, one of the reasons that we, don't have a lot of townhouses being built. People are willing to build duplexes, but townhouses just start running into building code issues that make it very expensive. I know my son is building duplexes. I said, why don't you put three? It costs you not, not that much more. He says, oh yeah, I got to put in sprinkler systems and think, and I perhaps more expensive sheetrock, but I know particularly this, the, uh, sprinkler systems are very expensive so people have not gone that route and certain neighborhoods also have covenants that don't allow um, more than one unit on a property um, cluster developments for some reason was put into the bylaw while i was a town meeting member many years ago and we have very few clusters. We have Stanley Street that I can think of. Stanley Street was built as affordable housing. And I, as far as I know, that's the only one, but that was to save open space and get more, more uh, density in town. Uh, my experience as, an, as, as a zoning board member, my, the first unit, the first case that I was on was with Chris way back probably 15 years ago or more for a duplex on Henry Street that was being built with money that came from UMass. And it was like, a, at that time, a competition or whatever you call it among architects, who's gonna come up for a class maybe, I don't remember. And then Cinder Jones gave the land and the, I think, but we had long discussions about that duplex and, and, and there were various people who were gonna do it, but it never happened. and. One of the other things that I have learned about the owner occupied duplexes is that we had several cases of people who had owner occupied duplexes and there is no market. People will not buy that with that restriction in the in the deed that it can only be owner occupied. And and I have been following the zoning board of appeals for the Indy over the past couple of years, and they have been giving special permits for non-owner occupied duplexes for things that were previously owner occupied. So there doesn't seem to be the market there for the kind of housing that you guys are proposing. Okay, Hilda, you're, way over, you're way over your time. Uh, so try to wrap it up. Yeah, I guess my last sentence getting back to what the governor was saying is that the the editorial from from uh, Governor Healy is that she's going to go start looking at people should start looking at state owned land, and Doug brought up the whole issue of Frat Park. Frat Park was a bust from the beginning, and there's a big hunk of parcel where, where you know multi use multi family housings would be allowed. And so that might be a thing to look at, a rezoning zone, um, Pratt Park over there that abuts multifamily housing. Where Where is Pratt Park? Pratt, Fraternity Sorority Park. Oh, um, over in Olympia Drive. Yeah, it, it was a bust from the beginning. It never happened. And and so now you've got Olympia, Oak, the Olympia Oaks and, and the Olympia Apartments going in. It, the rest of that parcel that isn't UMass land could very easily be, you know, quadruplexes and, and sixes. Because I own sixes and people really like them. Okay. So, Thank you. And it, that's the quick stuff that I said wasn't in any order. Okay. So did we touch on all your points? Mm, that's all, that's all. Okay. Well, thanks for coming up, following along here.
Okay, I don't see any other comments from the public. Um, so board members, we are gonna need to figure out how to narrow this down and come up with a recommendation about something and whether it's about what uh, has been proposed or whether it's about a uh, what's proposed with some mod modifications that we can all agree on. Um, I think at some point, it probably would be good for some of us uh, to show up with actual proposed modifications that we would support, um, maybe in our next, next uh, meeting or the next time this is on our agenda. Um, and, uh, you know, I know certain people have asked for more research or drawings or those kinds of things. And uh, unless I'm mistaken, we don't really have the resources to produce that information. And so board members may need to decide whether they can support anything without that kind of additional information. Um, or unless they can generate it themselves. Um, okay, I see three hands from board members. Bruce, you got there first. Oh, I was just uh, noting, uh, Doug, that uh, Dorothy Pam had popped a hand up uh, pretty oh. much as you started talking. And, okay. Oh, and look, everybody's putting their hands up. I don't know. Yeah, we've got a lot of... Whatever. That's your job. Okay, thank you, Bruce. Uh, bef before we go back to the public, uh, Chris, what, you had your hand up? Yes, I wanted to note that um, the planning department is proposing to um, advertise a public hearing for this project or for this proposal on M March 1st. And so um, that's within the time frame that Mandy Jo described to me. She said that um, the public hearing needs to start within 65 days of referral and March 15th is the outside date. And if it snows that day, who knows? Anyway, so we're going to advertise for March 1st. But that means you would still have an opportunity to talk about this again on February 15th if you wanted to. Right now, we don't have any anything uh, scheduled for February 15th, I believe, unless Pam has um, knowledge of something. Um, but anyway, so that's that's what we're proposing. March 15th, public hearing, and you could talk about this again on February 15th. Okay, great. Chris, All right. I, th I thought we were saying a March 1 public I'm hearing. I'm sorry, March 1. March, I said March it wrong. 1. March okay. 1, public hearing, February 15th, potential discussion of this again. Right. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, uh, Karen and Janet, I'm going to go back to the public uh, and let them speak their piece. And uh, I did let Hilda go well past the two minute mark. Uh, I see four hands from the public at the moment. And uh, Hilda, you probably already got six minutes. So uh, uh, I think uh, uh, if everybody can try to keep their comments succinct, that would be great. Let's start with Dorothy Pam. Name and address, as always. Dorothy Pam, 229 Amity Street. Um, well, I have a couple of comments. Um, this would proposal would increase taxes from um, apart buildings that we, we need, and we like getting more taxes. Um, and then the town could have more money to use on subsidizing affordable housing, which we are kind of doing. But what gets left out, of course, is the moderate income people and workforce housing, which many of you have mentioned tonight. That's the real problem I see right now. And um, I can see that the um, proposal is really working at trying to do something about that, but I'm a, I don't think that as it is now, it could do that. Um, quickly, I'm just gonna give you a couple of images of things that you know. You know the story about the camel that puts his nose in the tent and it really doesn't bother anybody, okay? So then it doesn't matter if the camel puts his head in a little bit further and this goes on and it's every little bit is really not that much of a change. It's just a little bit of a change. But after a while, that camel has basically taken over the tent and there's no room for anybody else um, because it's kind of like what I would call, the, there's a lot of logic in this proposal but some of it is what I would call seducer's logic. I mean, if you let him do that, then why not me? I mean, you did this, so why can't I do that? And bit by bit, because there was a lot of it, this will be just like this group that can do that, so why can't this one do it? 
And the more you do that, then there's, why have any rules at all? Just have let people do what they want to do, which is what towns used to have. Zoning is, is you know, they didn't have zoning in the old days. Um, but I, I just don't want us to be, and this is my last image, that frog in the pot where the water is raised bit by bit and not by that much each time, but the end of it, it's a dead frog. And um, that's, I think, what Karen is mentioning. Many colleges have experienced that their town got to a point where it couldn't come back because they'd let things happen, which all, each one of them seemed reasonable or okay or not too big or not too bad. But then you add them all up and you've made too many changes. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Pam. Or Dorothy, I'm sorry. Um, so Hilda had a fair amount of time earlier. So why don't we go to Mario and Janet and then we'll come back to Hilda. So let's go to Mario next. Hello, Mario DePillis, uh, if you'd give us your name and your address. Hi, my name is Mario DePillis, 27 Gaylord Street in downtown Amherst. And I mean downtown. Um, I'm in, I forget which the zoning area that is general. Um, I'm right off of South Prospect. And I have students on uh, to the east of me and uh, you know, single families on to the west of me. I'm right on the border. People, uh, I've lived here since my family moved here about 1962. And I've seen the neighborhood change. My parents decided to build and live in an urban area rather than moving to South Amherst or a one of the outlying areas. It was a conscious choice to support uh, an urban lifestyle, but that has been uh, less and less tenable as the town has uh, chosen to uh, discriminate against uh, residents who are not students. People who fall out, uh, who don't have the, uh, <clears throat> the income of the students uh, supported by their, their, their families, uh, they cannot compete and they have to move out. Uh, so I think, uh, and the, the other thing is that the, this proposal is good in, in theory, but it, it's really ignoring the problems that is driving uh, the students to take over and driving the families and the less fortunate lower income people out. The lower income people simply cannot compete with the students. And until you solve that problem, you cannot build your way out of the problem. So I think that's the first problem we have to address. And I see I'm being counted down and I thank you for your time. All right, and thank you for your comments. All right, why don't we go to Janet Keller? Janet? Name and address, and you have two minutes. Janet Keller, um, I live at um, po on Pulpit Hill Road in North Amherst. Um, thank you for the opportunity to build on this conversation. And um, I do want to build um, on it and state that um, that it's very important. People talked about maps and pictures of, uh, of to build a solid foundation when we're building places for people. And one of the things that has struck me about our conversations is the zoning discussions um, get into the nitty gritty of, of um, the details of the regulation and it seems like the people, the places for people um, gets left out of that conversation. So um, I'm saying a big yes to maps. I'm saying a big yes to pictures of what um, this stuff would look like, who would live there, and an analysis of the impacts to the land and water resources that the people and the critters who already live there and um, the vegetation that we're going to depend on more and more as the climate changes more rapidly. Um, 
and uh, we've seen that this winter. So um, I, I, more dense places need more services. They create more pollution. Um, and we've left that out of the conversation. And so we can write these rules um, without taking those into account. And I beg you for more analysis, pictures and maps so that we can, and, and analysis of the impacts of a given regulation so we can see what it will do to people. And um, while I'm on the topic, um, Bruce mentioned, uh, someone mentioned um, about our notices. The people who are going to be impacted by these changes should have the courtesy and the respect of, of, of being notified so they can respond to changes and, and uh, comment on what it will do to their everyday lives and um, their economic well being. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Keller. Uh, Hilda, come on back. Let's try to keep it to two minutes. All right. No, one sentence of two things, two impact statements that, that you really need to think about. Because one, what would be the impact on historic districts, particularly Emily Dickinson, which is BN or very close to BN? Uh, that's a big moneymaker for this town. It brings in tourism, and we don't want to muck that one up. So you need to look at the impact of these zoning changes on the both both local historic districts that we have. And the second thing I want to say that nobody's been thinking about is most of the downtown and the older areas of town where you want to put these houses are non-conforming in terms of lot size, side and setback and things like that. Is that going to be allowed by right or by special permit? That really needs to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals. So those are just two things I wanted to add. All right, thank you, Hilda. Okay, uh, that's that was the last raised hand from the public. And Karen, thanks for your patience. You're on. Um, just very quickly, this is a very sweeping, huge proposal, and it had to be because it gives us. I mean, that's the purpose of changing things overall. But I propose that now it has to get chopped up into segments so that we can really analyze what will be the impact to the best of our ability and listen to the people that are involved, um, meaning the residents themselves. And also maybe, I don't know how you get the people that would build that, that just, just open it up. In other words, let's do it piecemeal. That'll, Okay, thank you, Karen. Andrew. Thanks, Doug. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll um, jump on what Karen said. Um, and maybe a little step further would be perhaps at our next meeting, we could devote our attention to how we might phase this. Um, because, you know, this, this has kind of a boil the ocean type of component to it, where we could spend a lot of time on specific topics. But Maybe we could just focus on, you know, what would be the first priority and and um, and that might make it kind of the most efficacious conversation we can have. So my okay. my vote for the, the, the team. All right. And you think you could come back with your idea for where you would start? Yeah, I, I would be happy to. Okay. Um, obviously all of us might think about that too. Uh, Johanna, mm -hmm. welcome to the conversation. Thanks. I've been here the whole time listening. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I've been synthesizing my thoughts. And um, first of all, I just really want to thank Mandy, Joe, and Pat and everyone else that they've involved for what is clearly a boatload of work. Um, I thought the articulation of the goals was really good. And I agree with those goals. I also think that it's really important to acknowledge that the status quo isn't working. Like we know that our zoning has not 
or zoning has been broken for a while and neighborhoods are already being hollowed out. Housing costs are already high. People are already being forced out of town or choosing not to live here. And so if we don't act, those trends are likely to continue. So I like the idea of doing something. And I think the approach that's put forward is really thoughtful. I think it is logical. And I actually appreciate how comprehensive it is. So some people are saying, oh, we have to slice it up and just do one piece at a time. I actually appreciate the comprehensive nature of it and feel like it's a comprehensive nudge. So it's not a comprehensive leap, but a comprehensive nudge. Um, and hopefully it moves the needle. Um, I think in the past couple of years, we are finally generating some housing downtown and in village centers, but my guess is that there's still just a huge backlog and that's why we're not, you know, why we're continuing to see, um, high prices and, lo um, just a lot of demand. And I appreciate the focus on the transitional neighborhoods in the proposal. So, um, like Doug, I'm a little bit concerned about adding density in the outlying parts of town. I think our master plan is very clear that we want to direct density downtown and we want to direct density to our village centers and create multimodal transportation options so people aren't reliant on cars. Um, so if there was, if there was, like, as we tackle it, my proposal would be that we start by seeing if we can get on the same page about the kind of areas of higher density and prioritize those. That's what I got. Thank you again. Okay, thanks, Johanna. Janet, you're on. Thank you. Um, so, so I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out how to how we can talk about this because I don't I feel like on one hand we really don't have a really granular we haven't discussed at a granular level, each of these things, um, you know, each of the, you know, like the presentation was very comprehensive, but it's not, there's a lot of detail. I have questions about or questions about choices that were made and how did, how do we discuss that? And so um, we could discuss all that or we could chop it up or, um, and how do we collaborate with CRC? And part of my feeling is, maybe not with the March 1st deadline for a public hearing, because that's the hearing for the public to hear about the proposal and we get their thoughts. And I'm not sure we're gonna collect our thoughts that well in the next meeting. Um, and so I, I would just wonder if we can push it from March 1st hearing date to March 15th to kind of work on it more. Um, yeah, I also, we do have a mid-February meeting before March 1st. Yeah, and so I maybe, you know, maybe one thing I could do is just send out like a list of all my, you know, thoughts so people could brood on them or ignore them as they choose. One thing I had thought was like, let's maybe invite some ZBA members in because there's this idea that somehow the ZBA is blocking or not letting all the density that sits on the ground. You know, we have a lot of, we have a, we have a town that's not zoned for single family housing. It's zoned for everybody. It's zoned for, you know, four units per acre, five units per acre at a minimum, most of the neighborhoods. And the question is, why can't we get to that? And it seems like, oh, the ZBA is stopping that. I don't quite understand that argument. I don't really get it. And I wonder if the ZBA would have, you know, some perspectives on this. Um, do they feel like they're saying no to too many things? Like, in my impression is they say no to hardly anything. And so, and I don't see that what they do is that different from what we do. And so I'm just kind of wondering if we can invite someone from the ZBA to come talk to us or look at this or have thoughts at the next meeting. Uh, I big Chris, action. I see your hand pop up while Janet was talking. Maybe you have a thought about that. Well, the ZBA is asking for a presentation about this. And on February 9th, I'm going to give them kind of a summary of what is being proposed. We're going to include the packet that you received tonight into the ZBA's um, packet for next Thursday, February 9th. And then on February 16th, Mandy and I believe Pat will accompany her, are coming to um, make their presentation to the ZBA like they made tonight. So until the ZBA becomes familiar with what's being proposed, 
it's probably not um, useful to ask for their input, but after that, you could ask for their input about what they think about this. Just wanted to let you know that. Chris, uh, is it your impression that ZBA has been turning down a lot of proposals that would increase density? CBA grants, I think more than 95% of the uh, requests that come to them, um, you know, every once in a while, um, it becomes clear that they're not going to approve something and someone will withdraw the application, but that is relatively rare. So CBA usually tries to work with applicants to put on the appropriate types of um, conditions that will make whatever it is be suitable for the location. So. so, Janet, I'm not sure where you, I mean, what you're talking about with respect to ZBA turning a lot of things down. I, I thought Mandy Jo presented, you know, getting a special permit as an impediment and a long process and expensive and that, you know, the. It certainly uh, discourages people from proposing things in areas where a special permit is required. I mean, do we know that? I don't know. Yeah. I, I mean, mean, you know, I think anecdotally, I think Chris and Nate maybe have said they get calls from developers. And when they hear that a special permit is required for whatever the particular project is, that's enough to say, you know, thank you very much and move on to the next town. You know, but it seems to me just in my, I don't know if it's four years now on this board, there's been a lot of duplexes and applications to the ZBA. That, and, you know, when it's like when Chris and Pam bring them to us and say, do you want to know more about it? It just, all of those have gone through, except for I think one. And I don't know the reasons for that one. Mm -hmm. So it'd be good to maybe have them come in in March then and talk to us. Because, you know, I think we're, I see them as fairly parallel tracks in terms of applications and the requirements and the standards. Um, and we're all, you know, in the mood to say no, we're all, I mean, say yes, I mean, <laughs> some of us are in the mood to say no, but, you know, it's, I don't, I don't see how this, that will tip the process towards unlocking the current zoning, which is very progressive. I mean, we're, we're in a, I think, a rare town in Massachusetts for how much density we allow. And I don't know what the reasons for people not doing it. Some people probably in a RN probably don't want to build a triplex or four, convert their house to four units, but they can. So what's holding them back? Okay. Uh, Chris, your hand is up again or still up? Well, I just wanted to point out to people that if we open a public hearing on March 1st, that doesn't mean you're going to close the public hearing and make a recommendation on March 1st. So you have an opportunity to, you know, think more about this, hear more about it, discuss it, and then you can continue your public hearing to a date certain in the future when you feel like you're going to have more information or you could um, plan to have a uh, plan to invite ZBA members to come and testify um, at a public hearing session, but the public hearing doesn't have to end on March 1st. I think you all know that, but I just wanted to point that yeah. out. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, let's see. I don't see any more board hands. I see one hand from the public, Jennifer Taub. Uh, why don't we bring her over? Jennifer, if you can make your comments uh, in two minutes or less and give us your name and address. Uh, thank you, Jennifer Taub, 259 Lincoln Avenue. I really just had a question when uh, following up, and I appreciate your letting me speak since you finished public comment, but um, what Janet had asked about the special permit, and Chris might be able to verify this. Um, I had heard that sometimes if someone wants to open a restaurant or another maybe business downtown, downtown, they've been a little scared off by the special permit, but I'm not aware of any developer, you know, someone who would want to build a townhouse, um, and I would think even a triplex of being um, scared off by the special permitting process. I mean, if since since most of those special permits have been for housing for students, this is where that demand is. So I don't know that, like, I think of the Sunset Fearing townhouses, you know, they went before the ZBA. It was a much better project after um, the community, the surrounding neighborhood really appreciated 
some of what came out of the ZBA hearings as the developer was, you know, felt like they had come to a good, um, you know, agreement with the community, but I don't think they were going to go build those townhouses in Pelham or Leverett. I mean, there's a reason why um, housing development is they want to build in Amherst because this is where the university and the students are. And I don't believe I would want to know if that's the case, that there is any history of a developer deciding not to build in Amherst because they have to get a special permit. And it does a lot to protect the surrounding neighborhoods. And again, I don't I would wonder if anybody has not built, you know, a townhouse or apartment because of the special permit. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, um, that was the last hand I see at the moment, and it's 8.47. We're well over our eight o'clock target for a break. Um, so maybe we should table this topic for tonight and take a break, and then we'll come back to the next item on our agenda uh under under old business so uh unless anybody wants to raise their hand and object i think we should take a break and thank you mandy joe for uh your prep your presentation i i gotta say there were a lot of things in that presentation that i think you know we're just good primers on our bill on our code on our on our zoning bylaw so um you know keep don't 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 uh discard that after we're done with this particular conversation. And so- Thank you, uh, Thank you for having us. Yes. All right, the time is 8.47. We'll take a five minute break. Let's all come back at 8.52, 8.53.
All right, I'm seeing the clock at 8.53. So if you are hiding behind your camera without it on, uh, please turn it back on so we know that you are back in attendance. So Johanna and Janet, if you are in earshot, I think you are the two that are remaining. <laughs> <laughs> I'm back. All right, Johanna. That leaves Janet. Hello, Janet. All right, looks like Janet's back. So our board is reassembled. All right, so the time now is 8.55 and we'll continue with our agenda. Item four is old business, items not reasonably anticipated 48 hours in advance. Chris and Pam, do we have any old business? I don't think we have any old business, nope. Okay, all right, moving on to new business. Uh, the first item we have on the agenda is planning for housing growth, uh, a discussion about when we might get together. Uh, this is a follow-up to the conversation we had at the end of the last meeting about meeting together in person around a map and talking about areas in town where we thought maybe the zoning could be increased uh, you know, pr uh, prudently, let's, let's say. Um, so this is a conversation about schedule. And Chris, I think you had looked into when the town room was available and uh, when someone might be able to record the meeting uh as to make sure we were in compliance with the open meeting law so uh what were your findings well pam has looked into um when the town room would be available i asked her to look at tuesdays because you had suggested tuesdays doug so she came up with four tuesdays that would be possible to um be in the town room I didn't look into whether anybody could record the meeting that night because I'm assuming if Amherst Media can't record it, we can always record it um, via a um, you know um, um, a recorder that we have that we used to use in, in the old days. Um, people would be able to come into the room just like they used to be in the old days. So I thought we would try to establish a date, mm -hmm. and then we could um, determine if Amherst Media can be there. Um, okay. But I think we need to establish a date first. So Pam, why don't why doesn't Pam tell us the dates that she has um, uh, temp, uh, what do you call, tentatively reserved the town room? I did. Um, so I chose four Tuesdays that would be the opposite weeks of meetings. So let's see. Um, in February, it was February seventh, so next Tuesday or February the 21st. And I reserved it in March um, 7th and the 21st. So February 7 and 21 yeah. and March 7 and 21. Absolutely right, that's right. Okay, I heard you right then. So I, I guess board members are those 
you know, do Tuesdays work for you? I, I sort of threw that out last time, not really realizing uh, you guys would fixate on that date of the week. Uh, it does tend to work for me, but uh, can I can I see a thumbs up? Maybe do do Tuesdays generally work? Are we generally talking about evenings? Yeah, or this would be up? like you know, we'd meet at say seven to nine in the town room, something like right. that. So I'm not hearing any objections, Bruce. I see your hand. Yes, I'm going to be in the Bahamas for the last uh, for March, so uh, okay. I can't so do you... the last two, but I can do the first two, and I can okay. do I can do similar. Tuesdays are good. I can do April or May. Okay. Well, um, you know, I don't have any idea whether this is going to be a one-off meeting or whether we ought to be planning on a series. I guess it's good to reserve the room. Um, should we? You know, I, I mean, I guess in terms of preparations, uh, February 7th sounds pretty soon. Um, but I guess I was imagining we'd have like a couple of easels and a, one of them would have, a, you know, a, a big map of the town with zoning districts. And the other one might have a flip chart that we could just make notes on. And maybe we would want to have a, computer present that we could look at Google Street View if we wanted to look at, you know, some part of town we were talking about at street level and, uh, you know, or check out some other website, whether it's the town zoning or, you know, something else. And then maybe some trace paper that we could put over the map and then just use a marker or two to, uh, you know, mark up the things we're talking about or the different proposals or those kinds of things. So Chris, does that, is all of that kind of stuff around in, in the town hall or not? I think it is, yeah. Um, it would probably take us a while to assemble it, so. Um... Well, is the 7th too soon? Should we try February 21st and just do one meeting before Bruce goes off to the Bahamas? That would be my preference, and I would really love it if Nate were able to be there. And I wonder if Nate could tell us whether he's able to be there on February 21st. Big, big, big uh, intake <clears throat> on breath there, Nate. Yeah, no, I was, um, I've been trying to schedule a public hearing for that evening, but I think it's going to get pushed off to the 23rd. So uh, the 21st works. Okay. Andrew, I see your. Yeah, thanks, Doug. I was going to say most of what you said. Um, I think the seventh is too early. I I would recommend if we can um, that we'd have on that screen have like a, a GIS user be able to have like Arc Pro up or something like that, so we could get a little bit more detailed in in terms of um, the amount of information we could look at. So I don't know, Nate, if you're uh, or Chris, if either of you are comfortable at that level or not, or if there's somebody else on staff who is, I, I was going to have that on my computer for sure. But um, I think that that would make for a more useful conversation as we really try to hone in on on specific zones. Um, so if you, if you sort of scenario planning, if you brought your computer, is there wireless, Chris, in the town hall that Andrew could connect to and be accessing the GIS? There is wireless, yeah. We have the GIS viewer that we can use. Is that useful or did you have something else in mind for GIS, Andrew? Um, it, it could be, yeah. I mean, I think it, it depends on, um, again, who's available. I think like if you've got a, a power user who is uh, competent in Arc Pro, then you know we could do some, some more querying. I imagine a fair amount of this analysis might be to, let's query some parcels that meet certain criteria and that that would be um that would be something that's more easily managed through the the desktop software i might be able to help with some of that um it kind of depends on um what is available in the data that's online which is which is what i take a look at now i think it it may be easier to use like the native data you have but in any situation i would definitely say you know 
the 20 the 21st of February is, is the earliest unless you know there's a room big enough in the Bahamas for us uh, and I'm open for that too. <laughs> well and and Johanna put in the text that she's going to be that's school vacation week and she's going to be out of town that week. Mm. So I guess that's you know the question of whether we should proceed without Johanna or should we think about the week before like the night before our next meeting and do two nights in a row um I think you guys should go without me and I'll hop on when I get back okay so quickly Andrew we don't we don't have um you know ArcGIS other than just on our desktop so there's no way to have it in the town room you know it's a we have it just a you know a local computer license. So unless we're going to drag a computer in and hook it all up, that's not really something we, you know, we'd have to do those kind of searches. So if those are parameters, you know, we can discuss at the meeting, we can write them down and then generate maps or things afterward. Um, I can, you know, I can see why, you know, we used to have some, some of that available in our staff GIS viewer. So we could choose properties over a half an acre or between a half an acre and an acre or things like that. But I think we may have um eliminated some of those just because they weren't used very much and so you know if we think that's important we can at least i can take a look and see what we have available just through the, the you know the, the staff web gis would there be you know if, if andrew you know brainstormed his the queries that he kind of imagined and sent them to you guys would it be the kind of thing we you could generate a you know, a townwide townwide map of some of that stuff beforehand that we could then put on a screen. Doug, uh, maybe, yeah. I'm sorry. It, it just maybe it may make more sense to have this be more than one meeting, and then we just collect that information in the first meeting. Okay. And then move forward. Okay. I would say, for one thing, Nate is very um, what should I say stretched now because he has an, a few things that are um, coming along with deadlines. So, um, you know, producing a lot of work for the 21st is gonna be challenging. Right, um, I, I mean, you know, the, the, the hope with this was that this would be the board just getting together for a conversation and mm -hmm. generating whatever information it, it needed itself. And uh, I certainly wasn't trying to further burden the staff. Mm -hmm. So okay, so why don't we try? Why don't we put February twenty first on the calendars? And mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, Johanna, I'm sorry that you are not able to make it. And we can talk to our IT department about getting um, large maps, and we'll have to figure out what those need to be. Maybe we'll have a side conversation with you, Doug, about your ideas. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you know, I have the little eleven by seventeen of the zoning map. You know, I figured if we blew that up to, you know, three feet by four feet and hung it off of an easel, that would give us something to look at. You know, I have that map. I'm sorry, I got lost in the GIS search, but I have a map like that that Chris and Pam made for me years ago, so I can and bring that. It that's big. It's very big. I could I could unroll it now. It's it, it covers a good sized table. It's good to look at. But uh, Chris, I'm happy to talk with you more about that. Okay. But what I what I mentioned, you know, just earlier is kind of what I had on my mind. Mm -hmm. So you only mentioned um, a zoning map and a flip chart. Yeah. <laughs> so. That's all I mentioned. Yeah. And the easels. And an easel. Yeah, I mean, right. you know, a way to hang it up. Yeah. Get it vertical so that we can stand around and look at it. If vertical. it's a really big map, it probably can't fit on one of our easels. It'll probably have to go on a table. Yeah. So we'd all have to gather around the table. Yeah, well, that's yeah. doable. It's just a little harder for the people, the other people in the room to see what we're pointing at. Mm -hmm. Maybe they could come and join us around the table. Okay. And Doug, just quickly, I mean, you're talking about, um, you're talking about more dense housing. You're talking about something that, like, say, like UTAC suggested or the Comprehensive Housing Market Study where there's, you know, like larger multifamily structures, right? Or not, you know, yeah, is, think, it, is, mean, it any, is it anything? Or are you really kind of focusing on one type of, or, you know, a certain type of density or housing? I mean, 
the the ideas that I had sort of said I was interested in sharing were toward the larger scale. Um, but you know, I mean, we've obviously got the proposal from Mandy Joe and Pat that's at the smaller scale. And you know, maybe I don't know if the conversation will go there. But uh, you know, I was hoping there might be some areas in town we could upzone without getting a lot of that, that maybe didn't have a lot of owner occupied dwellings already and um, you know might not get a lot of a butter pushback and um, but would allow you know an increase in the supply of housing. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, I think, you know, like I said, I think, you know, UTAC and the housing study in a number of places identify, you know, have recommended yeah. that. I mean, you know, the housing study said we need 4,000 to 5,000 beds to kind of start to even the playing field for student demand. So, right. I mean, I, so I'm, you know, well, yeah. I mean, that that's actually the problem we have is that, you know, every, I mean, it is kind of a truism that the more housing you have, it's likely to start bringing rents down but the problem we have is we're so far behind on getting to parity that we're going to have to build units for quite a while before rents actually start to stabilize because of the demand that's just pent up okay uh janet your hand um yes i was going to say that um nate i hate to ask you this but if you could update that chart on the units that have been built and i think the ones oh, I, that come on I have a chart of all the units built since 2010, and uh, I just recently. Oh, what's good. That? And I yeah, just re I recently updated it with what I could find, and Chris gave me a few of the properties that I couldn't find. So, um, you know, I have that, and I can send it to Chris to share with everybody. Yeah, because we were on target for the housing market study, um, not the market study, the um, production plan two, two years ago. And I know there's a bunch of units coming on this year. Um, I also have some um, a handout I found from Ria Chow about um, kind of density that looks good and how to kind of mix it into kind of neighborhoods. And I can make copies of that. Otherwise, there's a lot of my scrawl on it. So I'll try to delete that. Um, and then, you know, maybe some village design kind of things to look at. So I could circulate that around. I've been collecting them from different parts of the um, planning community and things like that to think about, like, how it looks, I think, is important to people. Okay. All right. So uh, I think we've covered that topic. And we'll put February 21st on our calendars, that'll be an in-person meeting. Mm -hmm. First one in a couple of years. All right, um, time is 9-11. Moving on to item six, uh, do we have any Form A, a and R subdivision applications? We do not, no. Okay. Mm -hmm. Upcoming ZBA applications? Um, Nate? actually may know about a couple of them but i don't think the applications have actually been submitted yet have they nate no i mean we're you know there's a a few um you know, there's a converted dwelling in town a few for duplexes um you know a lot of them are some of them are modifying previous uh, permits to change some conditions but Nothing's, uh, you know, everything's kind of waiting. <laughs> kind of, it'll probably all come in next week, but they're all imminent, but nothing submitted yet. Okay. Next item, SBP, SBR, and SUB applications. Chris or Pam? Um, I don't think so. Are there any, Pam? Nothing new that I'm aware of, Chris. No. Nope. Yeah. Okay. All right, um, we're on to committee and liaison reports. Um, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. I can report that Chris has connected with the PVPC and they will accept a letter from me on town letterhead. Uh, 
you know, notifying them that we have nominated Bruce to be our representative. So I need to write that and send it off, I guess, to Chris or maybe directly to them and copy Chris. So we'll try to do that in the next week or so. Um, Bruce, I assume you don't have an actual update on PVPC. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, the end is in sight. You're going to have to start re re reporting soon. Oh. Uh, just before you go off to the Bahamas oh, or Bermuda nice. or whatever. Uh, Andy, uh, CPAC. Yeah, we haven't met. Um, we were drafting the report for town council. Um, I think yesterday or today was a deadline for revisions. I'm not sure when that, when that letter's going out, but uh, that's the only update that I have. Okay, Tom, DRB? No meeting since the last meeting. All right, Janet, solar bylaw. Um, we met and we talked about um, the solar survey and then also a, sec a small section of the solar bylaw. And I can't remember what section it was because I think I just wrote some comments in the definition section. I can't remember. Chris, was it, um, what was this? I'm blanking. It was monitoring and maintenance. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, like management. And then um, this week we're having a talk with Aaron Jakes is coming in the wetlands administrator to talk about groundwater recharge and wetlands and solar panels and things like that. Uh, when you say you refer to the solar bylaw, do you have a draft? We have two sections, I think, or three oh. now, Chris. I think we have three, three or four. Um, yeah. Okay. But it's nothing, it's nothing that's ready to present to the planning board yet. Okay. And Chris, CRC, anything you want to share? I haven't been attending CRC meetings. Um, they're still working on the rental registration modifications. And um, as Mandy just said, that's still in the works. Okay. So I, I don't think they're working on too much else. All right. Uh, next item is report of the chair. I think the only thing I wanted to say was to remind everybody we got an email from Chris about the conflict of interest law <laughs> and the need for us to do that uh, and get that finished in order to stay in good standing on the board. I don't think there was, there might have been a, there might have been a deadline or at least a request that we do it by sometime in February, but um, you know, just put it on your to-do list. Bruce, and I see your, Bruce, I'm I, sorry, Chris. I just wanted to note that it has been difficult to get into that program. I tried as soon as I emailed you and I had a lot of trouble. And um, the town clerk has told me that since then things seem to have been resolved. So if you had trouble, you know, a week ago, <clears throat> try again. Um, if you continue to have trouble, we'll have to let the town clerk know. Okay. Bruce, I see your hand. Um, uh, Doug, uh, Chris, I did this very recently, maybe four months ago. Uh, uh, I don't know whether it was for this or for the uh, Historic District Commission, but I, it, it, you don't have to keep doing it uh, like at the uh, uh, January of every year or so, do you? Uh, uh, we've been having to do it every year. Uh, Chris? I think you have to do it every two years. And on the off year, you just have to acknowledge that you've received some documentation from them about a summary, but they've they've changed the way they're doing it now. And they're doing it all online and the state is running it instead of the town clerks running it. So it's a little different. Um, but my guess is that since you did it so recently, Bruce, that you wouldn't need to do it again, but I can check with the town clerk. Yes, I know I did it online. Um... Okay. Well, it sounds like I'll check. Chris, if you can check and let let Bruce know. Uh, that's really all I had. Uh, Chris, anything on from report of staff? Um, I would just say that we have been interviewing people to um, fill the two empty slots that we have in our department, and we have um, some good candidates. So we're continuing to interview, and we're hoping that we can find someone to um, help us out and. I'm pleased with the candidates that we have. Good. Well, we hope you get some help soon. 
Okay, there we are. Any, unless anybody has anything else, um, time is 9.18 and we can adjourn. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Good, night. Good night. Good night. Bye. Stop recording.